welcome everyone to this sort of virtual panel as part of the ESOC Sci seminar series uh, held in conjunction with the Royal Society Te Aparangi's Early Career Research Forum. And the theme of today's discussion is interdisciplinary research in the PBRF era. So we have three and perhaps four panelists with us today that provide different perspectives on the PBRF, but in order to get our acronym, hey, come on, come on. the PBRF is the Performance-Based Research Fund. And if you haven't had the pleasure of being acquainted with the PBRF, it's part of assessing research quality and has increasingly come to take the funding opportunities that universities have available to them. Like any form of auditing exercise, it not only reflects reality, but it comes to shape reality for researchers in New Zealand. So we're interested in talking about the PBRF in general, but more specifically how it bears going on, on prospects for interdisciplinary scholarship at present. So early career researchers and researchers in general increasingly work across disciplinary boundaries, but the structure of the PBRF seems to impose a set of inevitably narrowing expectations on research. So we're interested in what the implications of these different um, research horizons are that are enframed by the PBRF, how we might deal with institutional pressures that arise from those scenarios, and what some practical tips might be for ECRs and others that are trying to navigate the PBRF landscape in the present moment. So those are the motivating questions for today's discussion, and it brings me to welcome our panelists formally. I um, should say at the outset that we asked the panelists to be involved because they provide a set of different perspectives on the PBRF in general and interdisciplinary scholarship in particular. So without foreshadowing too much about what the panelists might say. Um, we have the positionality of the departmental head, the PBRF assessment panelist, if James makes it to the room, that of faculty leadership, and that of interdisciplinary researchers as individuals. So we have Associate Professor Michelle thompson Fawcett, who's the head of the geography department at Otago. We have Ingrid Horrocks, who's a senior lecturer in creative writing and English at Massey University in Wellington and has served as a research coordinator for the School of English and Media Studies and has served on her college PBRF group. We may have James Prescott, who's a senior lecturer and academic leader of business practice at Unitech and is a member of the PBRF Research Panel for Pacific Research. And finally, we have Professor Alan France to my left here, who's a Professor of Sociology and Associate Dean PBRF in the Faculty of Arts at the University of Auckland. As far as the format for the rest of the hour goes, I've got some pre-formed questions that I've circulated to the panelists. I'll pose them to the panelists and I'll ask you to provide a comment on them in turn. If you don't have a comment, that's fine as well. We'll go through the four questions, getting their perspectives, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience, and we should have a fair bit of time to do that. So the first question I wanted to put to the panelists, and perhaps we can go in the order of Michelle, Ingrid, and Alan this time, is as researchers and colleagues uh, yourself, what's your engagements? Um, what have they been in the past? Um, especially in terms of the panel that you've submitted to um, and the sorts of considerations that may have gone into your submitting to particular panels. So, Michelle, if you wouldn't mind um, commenting on that first question. Thanks, Tom. My uh, research is inherently interdisciplinary. Um, and I have a lot of trouble deciding on what panel to choose when it comes to PBRF. So I don't think for me that PBRF in any way kind of dictates my operation. Uh, what I try to do is um, allow myself to work in a way that PBRF can recognise uh, without being 
constrained by it, I guess. So, for example, my primary areas of research relate to planning, environmental planning, environmental management, but almost all the uh, research that I do relates to indigenous experiences of planning and, in particular, Māori planning aspirations, development aspirations and engagement with local authorities um, in terms of bringing about transformation. Uh, but also at the same time, I'm in a geography department and I do what can be considered some pretty conventional uh, human geography type of work as well. So in the past, when I've been trying to think about what panels to select, I've had three panels to choose from, plus another um, area of advisory group input that I um, am relevant to. And so the, the panels for me are um, relate to planning. There's a panel on architecture, engineering, surveying and planning, um, which is the one I've tended to submit to as my primary um, panel. Um, but, but my work is all entirely relevant to Māori knowledge and development as well. Uh, and in the past, I don't think you can do this anymore, but in the past I've certainly um, chosen to have my work cross-referenced on my behest by the Māori um, panel. Um, but I also do work in human geography that doesn't look like planning, uh, and sometimes it may not, may not look like Māori knowledge and development either. Uh, then also my work connects quite strongly into practice, professional practice. And so at one stage, uh, my HOD had advised me to ensure that my work got cross-referenced to professional and applied research expert advisory group. So I'm falling across sort of four different areas with regard to where I could submit my work. I choose to submit it to the planning related panel. However, on that planning related panel up until this year, there has not actually been a planner present who does work anything even remotely associated with what I might do. There's been uh, an urban planning history planner on the panel who's Australian. Um, so reasonably unlikely to be strongly familiar with Māori aspirations and development planning in an um, Aotearoa context. Um, so not a great panel either. So I think one of the things that I've found quite liberating, I suppose, is that I don't feel a need to uh, aim at any particular panel because I know that I'll probably end up getting cross-referenced anyway to other panels. Um, I know that the people on my own panel are almost entirely unsuitable to be judging my work. So um, I have to focus on uh, being extremely clear, um, succinct, um, articulate about precisely what it is I do, what the meaning of it is, what the value of any outputs are, what the potential impact is, and why, in my case, for instance, um, my impact, which often relates to Māori communities and the benefits derived by collaborative research with Māori communities for Māori communities, is something that's worthy of um, um, positive evaluation by whatever panel I end up with, um, whatever um, members might constitute that panel. I should probably stop there. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. It gives us a number of things to follow up on later on and regarding strategies and how you go and fashion yourself for the PBRF without letting it dictate what you do. Um, but for the moment, uh, Ingrid, would you like to tell us about your engagement with the PBRF? Yeah, kia ora koutou. Um, yeah, I, am, I was an early career researcher. I sometimes still think I am. But um, yes, yeah, so I was in that bracket um, at, during the last round, having just finished my PhD. And I'm basically a humanities researcher, um, but I also do creative work. Um, and for me, that's a very important part of my research. So last time I had a decision to make between a humanities panel and the creative panel, 
Um, my book was a creative book. I had a book of poetry, which for me was my most significant output. Um, amazing the number of conversations I had with people where they sort of said, oh, it's a shame about the poetry book. It would have been better to have another article. Um, but you know, as far as I was concerned, it was quite good to have a poetry book. Um, so I, I found it very hard to get advice, actually, about who to submit to. Um, but I did end up submitting to the humanities panel. And in the end, I think I made a decision based on that was international publications. It was a little bit harder to work out how to frame the creative publications. Um, and then I found I had to work incredibly hard to write a narrative that said how my creative work and my critical work was closely intertwined. Um, that was the first time I had to do that. And I actually found it quite useful because now I, now I know how to do that and now I kind of frame my work up so it sort of makes sense. I have obsession and I go across disciplines. Um, yeah, so the other thing is that what I found is that I couldn't, I, there's no way in which I could drop one aspect of my work because my research contributions are very closely linked to the various aspects. So in particular, this, this year I'll have a very clear humanity um, portfolio. But because my creative work is very linked into the New Zealand literary community, my strongest research um, contributions are all related to my creative work, which means I have to keep both things, both things going. Um, but yeah, I haven't always found that a huge amount of disciplinary support um, at a high level to make sure I keep both strands going because it would be so much simpler if I could just be a humanities researcher. Um, so this round is going to look fine. Next round, I want to go much more in the creative direction and I'm going to have to think about how to do that. So I think that, that's plenty to get us started, I think. Thanks, Ingrid. And finally, Alan. Ah, kia ora uh, everybody. Welcome. Uh, thank you for the invite. Um, okay, well, my experience is slightly different. Firstly, uh, I've got no dilemmas over the panel that I submit to. I'm a social scientist, uh, always been a sociologist, and most of my work is um, is clearly focused on that area. I see myself as multidisciplinary rather than interdisciplinary, uh, and therefore it's a lot easier in a way for me to make choice and selection. Um, what I would say is that this is my second time of submitting to the PBIF. I came in 2011, uh, 2010, and I was here for the 2012 um, PBIF. Um, so, and that was quite different for me because prior to that I'd been in the UK and I'd submitted under the, um, the REF there, and I've done three times there. It's a very different type of approach because we know PBIF here is an individual submission, uh, the REF in the UK was always a collective submission for an institution. Uh, so it was very unique, very different for me, and was a little bit kind of alienating to start with. But uh, I found it a very interesting and useful process, as I'm going to explain later, I'm sure. Um, but so I've not had those difficulties around uh, where to submit my work. It's been pretty clear and straightforward, and will be this time around as well. So maybe I'll stop at that point. And I'm the least kind of problematic. <laughs> well, thank you all for your responses to the first question. The second question that I circulated was, do you see the PBRF and how your institutions react to it as posing any challenges for ECRs, in particular their longer term career development? And seeing, Michelle, that you had some comments at the start of your, com uh, your comments to the first question around not letting the PBRF dictate what you do, but nonetheless fashioning the way you narrate what you do in a way that is legible to the PBRF. We might start with you and then go in, in for Ingrid and uh, Alan finally. Sure, thank you. I think the way, so this is my fourth time being in um, a PBRF evaluation. Um, and I think when it began, there was a really strong emphasis in Otago, um, in my perception, to really push research and um, up the ante at Otago performance-wise in regard to research. And I think initially anyway, it, it led to um, possibly 
almost over prioritizing research against the other functions that we perform. So if you're a conventional academic at Otago, you have the 40-40 split in your duties. I presume that is probably quite common. Um, so research is only worth 40% of your activity in your, in your role. And I think what happened was that people uh, felt so concerned um, about uh, achieving well in PBRF. And the university I wanted to ensure that we achieved well in PBRF. And it was the only thing that was being sort of externally assessed. And so I think people uh, had pressure put on them and put pressure on themselves perhaps to perform exceptionally in regard to, to their research. I think things have pulled back since those days. That's, you know, that's like 15 years ago or so. Um, and now I see when I'm involved in promotions panels, for example, that people who may have achieved a PBRFA are applying to um, be promoted from senior lecturer to associate professor and not getting the promotion, um, thinking that they will get the promotion because of their PBRFA, but failing to get it because of their performance issues in other areas, such as service, which is often a diminished area of input, or um, in relation to their teaching and evaluations or assessments of their teaching. So I think at least my experience in Otago through processes like progression and promotion processes that run alongside PBRF is that uh, the emphasis is no longer so strongly on the research but a well-rounded uh, kind of academic career um, to ensure that you are producing as you would like to be producing in your research and ensuring that you do get time to do research. But, but recognising that it's still only 40% worth of your activity in the job. Now, quite commonly, and I, and I think it's most common, and I see it quite a lot um, now in the HOD role, the, the emerging researchers um, that I'm working with have often had a little bit of difficulty working out exactly how to prioritise research at all. So sometimes it's... Um, the research area is their weakest area, possibly because they haven't had good mentorship and can't quite work out how to deal with the pressure of standing up in front of 300 students and the necessity of getting lectures prepared and the time management around um, other aspects of their job and, and getting the research output um, undertaken. So a lot of my time is, has been working with the um, emerging researchers on how to ensure success in their research, um, ensuring that they have sufficient resources, uh, that they have collaborators that are appropriate to work with, that they're hooked into networks that will enable them to flourish, um, and that they're also looking in the right direction. So, for example, it's been quite common in our area for um, some emerging researchers to maybe focus on the wrong kinds of outputs, not just for PBRF, but for promotion and progression as well. So in human geography, for example, the thing that you'll be most well recognised for is peer-reviewed research articles in international journals. So sometimes you find that um, some emerging researchers that we have have um, focused on local journals or have focused on book chapters and just having a mentor that can um, guide them not to alter their research ambitions at all but to think about the priority that they give to different types of outputs to ensure that they can develop the career in the way that they'd like to. Um, so it's, so it's a sort of twofold thing, I think. Um, making sure emerging researchers have the capacity and the resources and the mentorship to do well in their research, but also bearing in mind that research isn't above and beyond everything else. It's still that 40-40-20 split. Thanks, Michelle. Ingrid, you mentioned before that um, 
you yourself have a split personality of sorts in regard to the sorts of research that you do and trying to integrate them for the purposes of the PBRF. I wonder if you had any comments on your own uh, trajectory, your career development and how that interacts with institutional resources and demands and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing I would just say is that also that the 40-40-20 split um, unfortunately is the standard across institutions and I think that's one of the complicated things with PBRF. So we work with a 60, 30, 10 split where I am. And as research is actually generally 20, um, the, the research can get squeezed. And I think it's useful when talking to managers um, about demands for PBRF to remind them that it's not actually a level playing field and that we've been judged in the same terms, but actually some people get significantly fewer hours to do it. And for example, if you're a contract staff member or have been during that period, you've actually had significantly less time. And I think that sometimes the universities can get into it around the PBRF year. They suddenly remember that it's very important, but it hasn't always been a, a given enough space as you go along. Um, yeah, I, um, it's interesting. I was looking at my portfolio. I think I've become really strategic in terms of trying to make things fit with my institution and um, and with PBRF. And actually, in the next round, I plan to pull back from that. Um, so I, I, what, I've, what I've been doing is, so every time I do creative work, I also do a critical work that I try to place internationally that is a kind of care. And whenever I pay for research funding, I um, do a, basically a double proposal where I say I want to do these two things. Here's the thing you recognise and which will give you the kudos you need. And here's the thing that I really want to do, <laughs> which gets it written up in quite a small way. Um, and I think that's actually served really well in terms of kind of career progression and it's been quite useful and quite strategic. But what I would, what I think sort of looking at it now is it's also made me flip what I really want to do. And um, I think what I'd, I'd, I'd sort of recommend and what I suggest is trying to really keep hold of that thing that is the most important thing about, yeah, one's own research. Um, yeah, I've spent so long making it legible that, yeah, I produce legible research. Um, uh, the other thing that just in terms of thinking about um, people coming through is that it does feel to me like uh, academic career is a really long game and that sometimes we can do that within a PBRF cycle, that it's a very specific little time frame and that the best work needs to come out and if it doesn't come out in the appropriate six months, then probably for your own career, not necessarily for your institution, but for your own career, getting, getting that coming out in the best possible place for it to be read and taken up is, is the more important thing. Um, and yeah, there are, there are really important things that you know are important in your discipline that aren't really legible to PBRF. So I guess becoming a really good translator, um, but not becoming too good a translator. <laughs> I think that, that was sort of my feeling around those things. Thanks, Ingrid. Uh, Alan, you... Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I've got many points I'd like to make, actually. Uh, just a couple of responses, I guess, to some of the points that have come so far. The first one, um, the issue, of, I will say the issue about mentoring. Uh, I think it's a real kind of issue for us in New Zealand. Uh, I don't know what it's like in the other universities, but I know here in Auckland, um, in my faculty, we don't really formalize it or make it something that is explicit and I think that it's something that should be. I think it's a, it's a weakness in our system and I think that everybody, not just early career researchers, but everybody actually should have a mentor. If you don't have one as an early career researcher, I think you should get one, somebody that you uh, can connect with and talk to. I think mentors are really, really critical in this game. Uh, as I said, it's a long, it is a long game and actually knowing how to perform over a longer period of time, how you make it, what decisions you make, having someone to talk that through with, I think is really, really important. My own experience, I've had mentors at all parts of my life, uh, my academic career, and I still have mentors now. I'm a professor. So I do think you should nurture, if you don't have them formally, you should definitely aim to nurture, nurture them. Um, the other thing I'd just say about the 40-40 split question and about the rounded academic, and I completely appreciate the point and recognize that's our game. We have all these 
duties to cover. But I will say I've sat on a number of promotion um, committees, um, appointment committees over time. And the first thing that happens is they pick up the CV and they count the number of publications. <laughs> and if you don't hit a certain level, then that goes into another box. Uh, now, okay, that's not really a way just to justify research, but it is uh, important for people to recognize how central it is to this game now in particular. And so getting your publications, a regular set of publications, I think is quite critical. So, um, so in terms of PBRF, I mean, I'm actually quite a positive supporter of PBRF. Um, not saying that just because I'm AD for PBRF mm -hmm. in Auckland. Uh, but I actually think it has a lot to offer uh, in terms of guidance. I mean, that issue about how to make decisions about your career, one of the things that PBRF does for us, it gives us some very clear indicators about what is valued and what is important in our discipline and what's going to, going to be assessed. And I think actually sometimes that's quite useful for people to have that uh, available to them. Um, so yes, it does require you to present your work in a particular way, but it does give you these kind of strong messages about what things are valued and what things are important. Um, and I think from when you're starting off your career and you're not quite sure where you should be prioritizing your time, uh, another point that was made, I think PBRF actually, people look at it and think, well, actually, if I, if I get this invite to do this, is that important? Well, maybe it's not. But maybe an invite to do this, it is. It starts to give you some good indicators of where you allocate your, your, your own personal time. Um, so that's one of the things I think that I quite like about the PBRF. It's now got some very clear messages for, uh, for colleagues about what things really count. Um, but also I think what I like about it is that it, it gives you a space to actually talk about uh, what you've been doing over the last six years. Um, and it asks you to explain the logic of that. And I think one of the things that makes for a good academic career longer term is a sense of logic to what we're trying to do and a model and a practice that we're trying to achieve something in some ways. And I think it allows us to reflect upon that and to get some thoughts about how we're developing our career. It also allows opportunities for others to comment on that, because that's the other thing, you know, when we put in this narrative together about our platform of research, uh, we get others to have a look at it, and it allows us to get some feedback on where we're going and what we're doing. So I think it offers some real opportunities for people to, uh, to, to sort of reflect upon their direction in some ways. Um, so it also kind of, a, it does have a very diverse coverage so it's not just about your publications. This area of research output, research contributions, for example, I think is really interesting. So the areas they set up are the things that we should be doing. And I guess my final point to make about all of that is, I think it's actually, that, that is business. What, is, what it's actually auditing is what we do in that kind of sphere of research. Yes, it doesn't cover the teaching so much, but it's definitely in the area of research. And I think that's sort of the business that we're, we're involved in in that area. And I think it gives us some good guidance of ways forward. Stop there. I've got other things I will say too, but maybe sure. at that point. Well, I think some of the things that you're saying, Alan, connects to the third question. So we might go Alan, Ingrid, and Michelle with the third question, which is, do you have any tips, advice for ECRs that might straddle disciplinary boundaries on how to frame their work for a single panel? And you're speaking, Alan, about having a cohesive narrative about your contribution. Yeah. Okay, so a couple of things to remember. Firstly, let's remember the panels are our peers, right? Our panels understand about interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary working. We're all in that game, in a sense. We all understand, you know, we actually, many of the people that are on the panels are in themselves multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary. Okay, so let's remember we're being assessed by our peers who do understand the disciplines and the cross-disciplinary work that is going on around the world. That sense. So it's not as though when we come to it with a, uh, a, a, an interdisciplinary perspective that in a sense the panels aren't aware of the tensions that people will have submitting to those panels. That's the first point I want to make. Um, the second is, of course, within the panels, um, there's been some changes to the PBRF. Uh, last time you could actually ask for your work to be cross-referred to different panels. Um, that's not available. You can only have it cross-referred now to the Māori uh, 
uh, Knowledge and Development or the Pacific Panel. But you can indicate, uh, there are spaces on that to indicate your, your interdisciplinary uh, kind of approach. Uh, so there's a kind of particular section which is the field of research option, it's got 200 characters, which you can actually give some good language, some words there that indicate that you've got uh, this kind of a particular approach. And also in your platform of research, you can also flag that up very clearly, very early on. So there are ways of making it um, explicit in the kind of process itself. It's not just you know taken taken out of the game in that kind of sense. Um, so I think those things are really really important. Uh, just to kind of remember that you're not in an environment where interdisciplinary research isn't understood. Um, and I think you know to go back to that point uh, that was made earlier quite rightly is. I'm not going to change the way I do my work. I just need to make sure that when I'm putting my submission together, I make sure that those issues are clear and explicit to the panel so the panel understands it. Uh, and if the panel wants to, of course, this is the other bit, they can cross refer to other panels okay, and get some guidance on it. And so it's worth remembering. So that's why it's important to be explicit about it and not to just leave it as a guessing game for the panels to work out. Um, my final point again, is just about the panels, who's on the panel, and this is a point that was made earlier, is at the moment we have a panel maker, which is quite small. They haven't appointed everybody to the panels yet, okay? And institutions are in a position of recommending others to go on. So, my, for example, in the humanities, one of the things that's a massive gap for us in the, in, in the Faculty of Arts is there's nobody on there who speaks another language. And we have something like six different languages uh, that some of our people publish it. Um, so we're going to have to recommend that some of those people, uh, that we have some representation on those panels, so those submissions can be assessed properly by people who speak in the panel. So the panels themselves will not be fully formed until February, which is quite late, late in the game, but when you're looking at where you should submit your work, do have a look at the panels, do have a look at the panel guidance, and see where you feel your work best fits at this stage. But you can also review that once we know a bit more about the panel in February, uh, if you find that the person's people that you think are better suited on another panel, you can still uh, possibly change at that point stage. Thanks, Stop. Alan. Okay. Uh, Ingrid, do you have any tips or yeah. tricks for new players? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and just to pick up on something that Alan was saying, yeah, I do think the emphasis on quality over quantity um, in PBRF is just incredibly useful. Um, to all of us as academics, I think, but also particularly to early career researchers in terms of being strategic and being research coordinator in our school. There is one thing I've noticed that my um, more junior colleagues are incredibly busy, but they're not always choosing the best, um, what we'll say, trying to get the best publisher if they can for an edited collection, for example. Where you're not doing any more work, but you might get quite a lot more payback. Um, so that's just jumping on the previous question. Um, but yeah, I do think um, <coughs> the overall narrative and the, um, the narrative of the NROs becomes incredibly important when you're not completely legible. Um, so one thing is partly also the choice of the NROs. So you want to choose your strongest nominated research outputs. But I think you also need the four that allows you to talk about you as a researcher as a whole. So, you know, sometimes possibly one that is slightly weaker might come up because you need that to make your narrative make sense. Um, I also would I mean, like to think quite carefully about ordering your NROs. So you, your descriptions of your NROs is a kind of story. So if you can tell the more obvious central part of the story up front, you know, I do this in the discipline you recognise, here are my key methodologies, and then by the time you get to NRO 3 or 4, you say, and I also take these methodologies and I do work over here in this adjacent place. So that you're kind of unfolding a story. Um, so, yeah, take, take them where they're familiar and then, then take them. But also, yeah, finding that coherence, finding a way to make yourself make sense is, is the greatest challenge. Um, and the other thing is we need our peers for that and we need our mentors. So draft and redraft and uh, yeah, I had a head of department last time who sort of said, oh, you, 
you do political aesthetics. And I, I looked at it and I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, I do. And now everything I write says I do political aesthetics. So, yeah, getting <laughs> the people's input is useful. Thanks, Ingrid. Michelle, do you have any tips or advice? Well, just really reinforce what Ingrid said. Um, I think that's really important, especially your sort of opening statement about um, the meaning and purpose of your research and then connecting your NROs really closely to that and doing it in the logical sequence that Ingrid was talking about. I think it's really, really helpful to the panel. I mean, there's um, guidelines um, put out as to what each panel focuses on, the sorts of topics um, that they're interested in, uh, the sorts of outputs they're used to. And I think you can tailor your um, your narrative to the panel that you choose and prioritise that in the way you deliver your overall story from that um, research expertise through to each NRO. Um, but then uh, make sure that you also cover aspects that are relevant in other panels that you might end up being cross-referred to or panels that you are finding it hard to make a decision whether to go with that one or another one. So make it that other panels are able to understand your research output as well and the way that you articulate it. But I guess for me, um, I, I tend to have gone down the track of not being too swayed by PBRF, but focusing mostly on reflecting on what it is I do, why it's important, why it's special, uh, why anyone should bother thinking it's a worthy activity and um, articulating that. So, for example, a lot of the work that I do with Māori communities is very, very slow. The research process is slow and it can be very slow producing outputs and that's because of the nature of engaging with Māori communities and the timeframes involved in that and developing relationships. Uh, and then the outputs, some of the outputs at least, need to be um, outputs that are not purely academic for credibility and ethicality and reciprocity, a lot of my outputs won't be academic in flavour. Now, trying to catch that and, and, and encourage a PBRF panel to see that as being utterly crucial um, as part of the reflective nature of the narrative that I would write um, so that I may not be their conventional kind of academic in the terms that they're evaluating everybody else, but they find what I say so compelling that they can't help but see it as being a worthy um, use of a researcher's time. So I aim to do that. Whether it's effective or not, I, 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 don't, I don't really know. But a, a key parting message on this topic, I think, is, is never under-convey the value or importance or significance or specialness of the work that you're doing. You're only doing it because you have a passion for it, um, that it's where you think your time is best spent. So how can you deliver that to the panel in a really compelling way, even though it's not their standard fare? Um, you have to be careful not to be convoluted in doing that. You, it has to be written quite carefully. But as others have said, it, it actually ends up being a useful exercise because it's, it's a sort of thing that that helps you think about, well, how do I write research grant applications? Well, now I know what I do. I've had to articulate it very, very carefully for people I expect not to understand me. And um, so you, you actually build up that repertoire of um, a basic understanding of what it is, what your mission is, and why it's important through doing the PBRF exercise. So I think it has a positive outcome in that way. Thanks, Michelle. I do have one question, but I do want to allow some time for people out there or in here in the audience to ask questions. So I'll save the fourth question in case we don't have any contributions from the virtual floor. But for the time being, I'll open it up to audience members in rooms or at their homes to ask a question of the panel. Um. 
I've got a question. Well, it's not a comment. I've got a comment. Go for uh, it. I'm, I'm Jamana. <clears throat> and um, um, I, I'm kind of pretty interested in what Ingrid said about the ordering of the research outputs and thinking about, and, and, and what I'm doing at the moment is, is reasonably recently finished my, my PhD and I'm really trying to think about where I want to go next. You know, what I'm getting from the conversation actually is I can, I can not only use my PBRF narrative to say, to look at what I'm, or describe what I'm doing now, the whole idea of ordering the outputs has, has made me realise that actually what I can also do is signal to myself and make an easy transition into the next PBRF round about where my research is going. So I'm kind of moving moving the focus of my research, my next research, um, but it's building on what I've done already and I can see it through what's been said that that could be a really useful exercise in that whole kind of focus of research. Can I respond to that? Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I do. Um, there's also room, I think, to be signalling that you know that this is this research builds on X, and this is connected. This new thing is connected in this way, and it's connected in the new thing. Like I do think there's actually quite a lot of space in the overall narrative to yeah be, be explicit about that transition. Um, yeah. Any of the other panellists want to jump in, feel free. Otherwise, I'll open it up again to someone to ask a question. Sure. Um, sorry, Reeves and Oakland. Um, I'm an urban planner and I'm interested if anyone's got experience in dealing with policy-related outputs, i.e. policy documents or policy evaluations and so on. So as a practitioner academic, um, and I would have colleagues as well, we actually do quite a lot of that work when it comes to PBRF rounds and company design, whether or not it should be in. I may have colleagues who don't recognise it because they're career academics, not procademics. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody come? <laughs> I'll open that to the panellists if either of you, any of you want to jump in. Uh, hi, Dory. Uh, yeah, I, I have experience of that. Um, I haven't, I don't think I've ever used a policy oriented document. I don't think I've ever used one as an NRO. Mm -hmm. certainly, they've certainly been there in some detail um, in my list of um, publications, uh, which I talk about in my um, opening statement about my research expertise. And for me, the, the work that I do it is oriented towards transformation. And there are various routes uh, by which you can achieve transformation. But for me as a planner, um, <laughs> the, uh, bringing about changes in, in policy and practice is actually a really important part of achieving transformation. So it's there very, very explicitly in my opening statement, but um, that, that I don't want to do this research for me, uh, you know, some people might be um, wanting to develop um, theoretical understandings. That's, that's not where my particular um, passion is. My passion is at bringing about transformation. So I'm looking to do research that can ensure that transformation um, uh, can be achieved. And therefore, the policy and the practice aspects of the work that I do, um, particularly with um, Māori communities, has to be at the forefront of why I'm bothering to do the research at all. So while it might not be the focus of the NROs, uh, it's a justification for why I choose the types of research topics and and and, and the collaborators, the community collaborators, to work with. So it's um, explicit and important in 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 the way that I convey my research. Can I can I just respond as well? Though? Yeah. Some of the panels uh, will clearly set out that they can be outputs. Okay. Um, I'm not sure about the panel you might be submitting to. But what's critical is, firstly, that they're available in the public domain, although there are 
opportunities to public uh, have confidential uh, reports included as well. But generally, the view is they should be available in the public domain. And the second thing is that they are being quality assured. And it's that level of quality assured kind of thing which will make them strong or not, in a sense. To what, you know, so if they've, been, uh, if they've been done by the ministry, research for the ministry, and it's gone out, been peer-reviewed by external colleagues, and come back, then it may well be that's worth considering as putting in as an NRO. Uh, given the narrative as well, which is, you know, uh, in terms of a platform, setting it out about its contribution to your overall uh, area of work. So I think there are places to put it, and I think there are ways, but I think it's been very clear about how it's been uh, quality assured and how available it is in public domain. That's kind of critical. Um, can I, Melissa, speak to faculty about um, Alan, what about research contributions, uptake and impact yep. for those policy documents that may not be quality assured as such? That's another space yeah. where you can talk about that kind of work in terms of the impact of your work. So yep. is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah very much so. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good point. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing with the... Um, uh, engineering, architecture and planning panel this year is that they have requested that one of the panel members be an expert in professional and applied research. So I, I think that's particularly helpful in this case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm just thinking, I haven't had any experience in this area, but in the um, adjacent field of doing creative work, one thing I have become more aware of having been through one round is to try and find avenues to get my work quality forward. So sometimes it's a matter of asking, you know, can we, can, is there something we can set up so this can be properly quality assured? It's also a great way of asking for more peer review, which is always a genuinely good thing. But, you know, actually, once you're aware of the systems, actually trying to, you know, if, if, if it's easy, trying to find ways in which they can be, for example, quality assured. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does any other audience member have a question they want to ask mm -hmm. the panel? While you're thinking about it, I've got one that wasn't on my list that I could ask the panel, which is, I suppose, the engagement with the PBRF might differ depending on whether you're in a permanent position as an early career researcher or whether you're a postdoc or a research associate of some sort where you're on contract. Are there things to be aware of if you're in the position of being a contracted member of staff that's PBRF eligible to take into consideration that we ought to tell people about? Mm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, well, uh, it's a difficult one. I mean, I kind of think if you are going to be uh, in post over the census period and there's a criteria for being included, a certain census date and you must be working on a particular contract over that period of time, you should take it completely serious and go and set yourself up and complete uh, a submission because if you are submitted to the PBRF, that looks good on your CV anyway long term. Um, so the, the difficulty comes if your contract comes to an end prior to that census date and what you should do in terms of should you prepare. And a lot of that's a discussion you need to have with your institution, your head of, your head of uh, school or head of department about where they see you in the to, to what level you can get involved. My advice is if you're an early career researcher, you should, you should get in there and, and put something together and start doing it, even if you might not go in, because the experience of doing it I you find really valuable. But I understand that that itself is a stress that you may have a lot of work on. And is it worth me doing it? Uh, if you're going to be here over the census period, yes, thank you very seriously. Um, yeah, I've got a few thoughts on that. Um, uh, um, one thing, yeah, it's a good, if you've got a strong PBR portfolio potentially, it is a good moment to talk to your, whoever you're working for and try and get either a better contract or something more ongoing. It is one moment where you have a bargaining chip, potentially, so I would recommend using that if you can. Um, 
if they if you're on a, sh a one year contract and your institution wants to put you into PBRF, um, they will get seven years of funding from you, um, even if they only keep you for a year. So again, be aware of that um, and try and get something for yourself out of it, <laughs> like like making sure you're paid for research time during that year. You know, the, the institution has a lot to gain from using your PBRF. Um, and just one question that came up in our sessions a couple of weeks ago. Someone was saying they're a contractor in a particular department, but they also, maybe they're stronger researchers in a different area. Should they, could, you know, should they shape their PBR portfolio um, to fit where they currently have a job? And my response, my sense was that absolutely not. My sense would be that anywhere wants you to get the best possible PBR score, so you put in the best portfolio you've got regardless of who is employing you at that moment. Thanks, Ingrid. Michelle, do you have any input on that or shall I open it up to the floor? No, no, open up. Okay. Does anyone have a final question? We've probably got time for one other question. I'm going to pick up on the last one that you've got here. Sure. So if no one has a question, we'll return to the fourth one that I circulated to the panellists, which is that the PBRF does, uh, for better or worse, right or wrong, seem to cause a level of anxiety for some ECRs as a process that they're going through. And the question to the panellists was, do they feel that's in any way warranted? And do they have any advice on how that experience can be made, if not a positive experience than certainly a productive intellectual experience. So I might go the original order, Michelle, Ingrid and Alan to close. Yeah, I think it can be um, a really positive experience. Uh, I, I don't like the nature of auditing and I don't think it's um, uh, necessarily the best system, but I think you can make a, a, a really positive thing for you, especially when you think about how it can help you think productively about where you might head in the future. And I think things that help you there are recognising that your institution uh, wants you to uh, get a PBRF score of some sort, preferably of some kind of C or B. Um, uh, and therefore, they have some obligation to you to uh, ensure that that can happen for you with the provision of resources, funding, guidance, uh, encouraging you to find good collaborators that you can be productive with, encouraging you to develop productive relationships with your postgraduate students. So I think that all works together, both for the institution and for you as a researcher. And the other thing I think that's positive is that I think the best way to produce a portfolio is to do it in a shared manner with your colleagues, with your peers. And that way you learn different ways of um, telling your story. You learn uh, ways that people can understand and, 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 and view with great clarity, which is helpful for, for you in terms of your um, future work and your future efforts at um, getting resources and the like. But it also helps develop a, a cooperative um, culture within your unit, your department, your school um, that actually can be long-term and quite positive. So, yeah, so I think making sure that you uh, call on the resources that should be available to you and, and develop collaborative shared responses to PBRF with your peers are positive outcomes. Thanks, Michelle. Ingrid? Um, yeah, I also think it can have a lot of positive outputs. I do think it's been pretty well designed in terms of the C new and emerging, not asking too much of early career researchers, and then anything above that is a bonus. So, you know, getting that in place and then actually anything else is just you developing how you talk about your research. Um, yeah, as I said, I think having to articulate your research platform, really, really useful. Um, and kind of a pleasure to look at what, think, what, what do I do and what have I been doing and what do I want to do next? Um, and just one other thing, almost outside to go. So if you do produce research, 
that actually isn't particularly of value within the PBRF structure, then I do think it provides an opportunity to think about that research and if that, what is the alternate value system you're working in. Um, and I think we're really busy, so if we're doing other work that isn't legible, we need to be quite um, clear about why it is valuable. So finding an alternate way to articulate that to yourself I think is, is quite useful. And sometimes there are things that we're asked to do that, you know, you get a lot of invites as an academic, and sometimes working out how to sift through them and say what you're not going to do is quite helpful as well. But I, yeah, I think it can be quite can be quite a positive experience. A lot of work in the middle of teaching, but you know, you get it done. Thanks, Ingrid. And finally, Alan. Mm. Oh, well, I agree with both the, uh, the the last speakers. I mean, I think there are very good points being made uh, about the value uh, of of PBRF for early career researchers. A um, couple of points I kind of add. Firstly, I mean, let, let's recognise none of us like being assessed, right? We we all get anxious about it. You know, it's kind of it's it's nothing that we feel comfortable about. So it's it's obvious that uh, early career researchers will feel anxious about this as well. And we have a responsibility, and senior people within the uh, within the disciplines also have a responsibility to reassure our colleagues uh, that what this process is a positive one, not a negative one. And the second bit to that, I think, is to acknowledge, and I don't know how this is national, but in Auckland, um, we uh, you, nobody sees your score, right? Uh, your head of school doesn't see your school score. Your dean doesn't see your score. Uh, it goes uh, into planning. It's a part of the planning process and allocation of resources. But the only person that sees your score is you, okay? Um, and that should be reassuring to people in a way that it's not. And also attached to that, we have a policy that we don't use it as a part of uh, assessing people for promotion or for performance. Okay, so it's not brought into that kind of debate at all. Right? This is something completely separate from that. And I think people should be reassured uh, that the system is set up in that way, that uh, in Auckland anyway, so I'm not sure if that's the national, but in, in Auckland that is the case. Um, and I guess attached to that is to recognize that the PBIF does acknowledge newly and emerging. It actually, this time round, has given it the category CNE, right? And it's actually located it in the funding stream uh, above a C. So if you are newly and emerging, the university gets more money for you than if you are a C, okay? And that's given acknowledgement to uh, where people are in their career. And what I like about this model is it's saying, and it's very clear that we don't expect everybody to fill all those boxes in and to have masses and masses of material. It depends where people are in their career. And the people on the panels will assess it on that basis. And I think that's a really good model of working. So I like that. I think it's very positive. Uh, and people who are early in their career should recognize the fact they can't fill all the boxes in. They can't get, uh, you know, even all the NROs, uh, OR, sorry, OROs, sorry, NROs completed. That will not necessarily disadvantage them. They can still come in and get a score of newly and emerging, and the university gets the resources, which they can then put back into that group, hopefully, to help them in their career development. Um, so I think it's important to recognize that, that the system itself acknowledges career progression and where people are, people are at. Thanks, Alan. We've just hit one o'clock, so mm -hmm. I'll wrap things up very quickly. Thank you to Michelle, to Ingrid, and to Alan for being the panelists on today's discussion and thank you to all the audience members out there and in here for coming along and I encourage you to keep a look out for the next seminar as part of the ESOC site series. So have a good afternoon everyone. <laughs>